knowing that there's a war in the world affect your participation in DAOs and your everyday life. And I feel that sometimes uh, when we are in an organization that is goal oriented, sometimes we, we tend to, to act like it, nothing is happening. And um, I think this soft gov call could be a, a, a good space to talk about this. And yeah, for me, it, it, it affects me a lot. I think that um, all war is deception and that um, I, 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 I am really impacted that uh, the history of humankind uh, is marked by war. And, and I really desire um, that sometime we can um, advance and as, as, a, as, a, as a humanity, but without the use of violence. And like, I feel that I am motivated because I am working in, in gravity and somehow that is a piece um effort that i am trying to bring to to um daos but yeah I, I i am always scared about what can happen about if these things scale and also that um i i also think that if if daos don't um change the way of operating we can end up seeing in the future like violence or DAO wars. And, and I think that, that um, that's why it's so important to work on culture in these kind of movements. Yeah, that's, that's how I feel. And, and I, I needed to take that out because sometimes uh, these last days I have been having trouble sleeping and I feel like anxiety, but um, yeah, there, I know that there's not much that I can do. So, so I just, um, I'm doing what's in my plate. How, how about you, Ben? Yeah, um, I definitely, I don't know, I, you know, it's, I don't know that it's affecting participation, um, but I definitely feel, you know, like, um, it, it highlights the importance of of um, culture and, and gravity and um, some of these soft gov things that are cultural. Um, so, like it, it gives a good, you know, while we're doing all this stuff, it there's always that real life example to point to and and say you know this is why this is necessary um so i don't think it's affected my participation as much but it's definitely been on my mind a lot more um so probably affecting my mental health and maybe uh <laughs> by indirectly participation but yeah um i'll pass to NT. Hey, thanks. Um, well, I think I'm going to change a bit the phrasing of the question because I don't think it, like, I don't think it's exclusive to to war. In this case, the the Ukrainian war. I think every kind of um, 
collective conflict brings um, indirect issues to everyone and to communities like ours. Um, say, for example, uh, the the ENS thing a couple of weeks bef uh, ago, and some other issues. Um, I don't think they have a direct impact on on us, but the, we can definitely feel some tension, um, in, like the the um, the overall ambient uh, is like a, a bit hostile. I think um, in, uh, we have. I think we have to take to have in mind that. Um, I don't know. It's it's a hard question because uh, there's not too much that we can do. Um, a lot of these issues are like uh, on on a higher level, and they affect us one way or another. But it's not like we have direct participation on the outcome. Um, so we have to. Uh, well, at least that's what I try to do. I try to help if I can, but uh, if I can't do much, I try to focus on something else, uh, some perhaps more productive or, or like that. Um, what about you, Nate? Yeah, thanks, Santi. Um, <clears throat> well, on a personal level, you know, especially concerning the Ukrainian Russian war right now, um, you know, I, I've never been more motivated in my life. I really like <clears throat> war. War brings a certain animosity to the status quo that I I think that you witness. You know, you you can see the the war happening, but you can also see the the other the flip side of that coin, where you have you know thousands of people in Russia protesting every single day. You have people all over the world who are rejecting this notion of how things are being run at the moment and you know that that is an incredibly motivating factor that you have millions of people all over the place that are looking for alternative solutions than what is currently being provided to the world and i think that what we're doing in DAOs is a fundamental component of that type of solution and i, I just yeah i think it's i think while war is completely horrible and I'm not a fan of it. I, I do find it extremely motivating to see so many people who are just who are so ready for for alternatives to to the status quo of what we what we've been dealing with over the past you know three four decades with foreign policy and countries and how we operate in the world. So um, it's just something that motivates me to be honest with you. Um, and I will pass it over to. STG. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, no, this is a really topical discussion. I, I really was looking forward to joining today. I also got back from East Denver, and so I was, my head was brimming with ideas, and I had the privilege of having Wi-Fi on the plane where, where I read the news of, uh, of uh, current situation, and it really, <clears throat> um, you're right. I mean, it really is a it's a disrupting moment, right? There's a status there's a status quo that just ended and we don't really know it's sort of quantum what new status what new um paradigm we're entering into and it's sort of in flux. And I think that's what I find very disconcerting because it you know, um, the options, some options are really I think like going back sort of to an old governance model we used to have before. We have sort of more of a rule-based system, but it, the rule-based system also a bit failed. So I think in looking around governance, it is like, how do you, what what is the inspiration for a really like new thinking around how we collaborate in a digital, digitized, globalized, sort of often, at least in these digital spheres, very borderless. And um, I think there's a lot really to, to look to look at that I think you can you can build on because you're right. I think this is a breakdown and yet there's a lot of new ways, especially the digital world has influenced this 
that I find really like powerful. I mean, yeah, you see the misinformation and all the, the, the sort of the negative side of digitalization. You can also think around like all these really incredible stories and the fact that people are watching the whole planet is sort of watching something at the same time and commenting on it. And, and if you can have trusted source of information um, that, that also can be spread across the globe. So, which builds solidarity and peace. So I think like, yeah, you're, I think it's just a very disruptive. I think the disruption is concerning and the actual events are very tragic. Um, and as I said, we're in this quantum moment. I think that's why, that's why soft gov is so important because it consistently needs nurtured and worked at. And this is definitely a moment for that because it's a new dawn is, is emerging and it's not, we're sort of all building it. The entire planet is sort of deliberating and building on that. Um, so good to be here. Uh, I don't know if anyone was, I came late, so I don't know if Zeppi spoke. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, STG. I mean, for me, like, we are always in war, so, you know, like, no one is, like, ever talk about, uh, you know, the war. The Ukrainian war is not the only one that is the war we have right now. Like, there's people dying every time from a gun, every day, uh, because wars in, you know, uh, I don't know the names in English, but uh, Arabia Saudita and all those countries, like, they are, they live in war. Uh, and you know these people also need help but I feel like you know like what all these things about Ukraine like it's just you know Putin doing stuff like to get it's not like Putin wants something from Ukraine he wants more stuff like from Europe and the States and this is this is so wrong because uh, in order to affect you know like you have a problem a conflict with the States or Europe or whatever you're affecting other people that have nothing to do with that and yeah that's awful and yeah i think like rich you know i really think gravity uh you know in a bigger scope and you know also transparency on how uh, governments are working like governments are buying uh, guns and then selling it to both sides of you know they're selling guns to russia but then also to ukraine and it's, it's just a business like and we need transparency around all of that that's the way also to to stop it and yeah i don't have anything else to add and oh welcome teresa sd like we're just having like an intro question uh how those who are in the world affects your participation in DAOs and your everyday life i don't know if you want to introduce yourself and then answer the question yeah She said, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hi. Yes, I'm very happy to be here. Yesterday, I had my own boarding with Manuel. And we're just like, and we're, I'm just like checking out different working groups here at Tech. And I love to contribute. Um, I'm a lawyer. I currently live in Mexico. So I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. And I had a experience um, uh, contributing with DAOs. I've contributed with communities, uh, speech, especially writing and the legal side, but with DAOs, not yet. Actually, in the TC, yep. there is a uh, uh, legal working group. Uh, but yeah, in the, whatever you wanted to say, just go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that, but uh, you may be interested in, in checking out the legal work group. Thank you, I'll do so as well. And um, yeah, actually like this meeting is a bit weird, like normally Libby is uh, leading, facilitating this call and yeah, right now like she was not here and, and I wanted like to keep the discussion around the advice process you bring up the last day, Nate. So maybe, yeah, like what you were saying about, you know, uh, make sure like bring the agency to every contributor and let them know that they have the power to make decisions. I don't know if you started working on that, uh, but I think that was yeah. an interesting topic. Yeah, uh, still working on that. I think the, the, the biggest part of this is about education. Um, 
And that means when we get into our individual working groups and we're working with each other, that people, especially newcomers, and ourselves especially, uh, understand that we have the discretion to make decisions. We have the agency to take on tasks, to execute on those tasks, and there's nothing hindering us from executing on them. Um, and, and the advice process is meant to be a one tool in the toolkit for our governance that, that is, can be utilized to inform that decision making. Um, and we want to make sure that the information flow uh, for making responsible decisions within the TEC are done so. And we, we condition ourselves to actually use this advice process because at the moment, you know, we talk about the advice process and we talk about it and we talk about it and we talk about it, but we don't educate on it. And so I, I think that needs to be a core fundamental thing that we do in every working group. It should be done at the beginning of the gravity working group. It should be done at the beginning of the comms working group, stewards, everything. Um, we need to educate people, every single newcomer to come in, what the advice process is, and let allow them to understand that they have agency to act. So if Teresa, if you wanted to do something on behalf of SoftGov right now, you have complete agency to do so. You may not have the, the, the knowledge to, to execute on it, but that's what the advice process is meant for. And so I want, want to make sure that everybody who comes into these working groups is recognized and that they understand the power that they have in terms of executing work and making sure that they have pathways of participation. Um, this is something that's very hard for a lot of newcomers because they are conditioned to think in a centralized context. They are conditioned to think of having a boss or a supervisor or somebody that they have to get permission from. And this is something that's very difficult to overcome. And that's something that we really need to condition people in a different way. Uh, if, we, if we really want to see the predictivity and the output that uh, DAOs uh, currently lack, in my opinion. Yeah, totally. Uh, I wonder if, like, is there something like, like people in this call could support you uh, to achieve that? Or are you fine? Like, uh, how are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, right now, like, I'm working with uh, people over at comms to try to, to get some graphics done. I know that we have the one graphic, if you scroll down a bit on that agenda document. Uh, a little bit further. Right there. Yeah. That guy, I don't know if you can zoom in on that, but this is the advice process that we have set out. And so um, the idea is that we need to, to better understand who our subject matter experts are, um, people who are closest to that decision making. Uh, so if you're in you know, a legal working group or your gravity working group or your comms working group and you're working on a certain particular subject, you want to, if it's a small impact thing, you want to make sure that you consult with your, your working group. You want to make sure you consult with the experts who are daily working on these types of problems. And then we need to figure out ways of escalating that. So if there's a problem or somebody dissents within that decision making that says, hey, maybe you shouldn't do this, but you think it's right, you should have the ability to escalate it to a larger audience and keep escalating it until it becomes a community-wide vote. And so that's what the advice process is designed for. And we need to we, need, we really just need to focus on making this accessible to each other. And I think the most accessible way is what I'm doing now, you know, talking to you directly. Um, there, you know, there's limitations to what I can do in the digital format in terms of education. We can do graphics. We can, um, we can put it, you know, I can make it, make, put a dedicated website and make everybody have a bookmark for it. Um, but, but these need to be on the forefront every time we make a decision, this advice process. And I'm not sure how to do that except for direct education. And so um, that means we all have to take responsibility in educating each other with it. And so uh, in terms of needing help, um, yeah, it, it just needs to be a cultural practice that we, we do it. There's not really much you can do in terms of documentation that will assist. It just, it's, it's on the individual. Uh, to to do it, and so I, I I encourage everybody to actually just keep focusing on uh, educating the advice process to everybody you can, to educating them on what their rights are within the DAO and how they can best uh, participate. But I was just going to jump in on this thought because 
I like this idea and I do think it's really would I've seen some DAOs also that have like listed subject matter experts and it's sort of um they're sort of tokenized. You could you could make it very gated or you can keep it open, but um I would be probably more in favor of the more open. I, if you're I allowing agree. and yeah. I've seen some really interesting tools actually we're, in my organization where we were experimenting with one AI driven one and you basically would do like an intake form. You ask some questions and it, it basically gives you a, a score. Um, and th that score is sort of assessing your core competencies under certain yep. areas. I'm not saying these are perfect off the shelf. Absolutely not. You have to then configure them a bit sort of towards what you, what you like, you have to have sort of a community understanding as to what you would score Certain subject matters teased, you give certain more value to others. What past experience is a good proxy? I mean, these things I've seen it work in practice. It's it's okay, but you have to consistently configure it. But it's a, it's a nice tool if you really start thinking about scaling these things big, right? Where it sort of becomes un unwieldy or it becomes very labor intensive to do it manually without yeah. some sort of tool. And I hope I hope that's what source cred evolves into. Uh, it's it's just not it's not there yet, but I do believe it has the potential to do that because you're exactly right. It's like you know we may have like one or two subject matter experts, but that that is two opinions, uh, and and not necessarily um, focused on that particular area of expertise because there's different areas. And so like Durgadas, yes, he's extremely competent in HubSpot. Um, but will he know every HubSpot question? Maybe not, but he's our only a subject matter expert, and so we're only getting that perspective. And so I think SourceCred could serve as a potential solution for um, giving out credentials around different topics or areas of expertise, and then hopefully having some type of weight behind those that input and that advice process in the future, where if I'm an expert in um, decision making, for example, let's say that I have a lot of expert decision making expertise. Um, if it comes to a matter of decision making and how we make a decision or design a decision space, my vote would, my advice would weigh a little bit heavier on a decision than maybe somebody who is strictly from, you know, uh, gravity or strictly from, uh, you know, marketing. Like, the, and so I think that holds a potential solution because right now you know we we expect like okay we have one or two su subject matter experts and we expect to have good outcomes all the time and that doesn't guarantee good outcomes what guarantees good outcomes is having a lot of people with a lot of who the, sorry not, not having a lot of people having the right people in the right room for that decision space to be made and that's the hard part <clears throat> yeah that's why i was going to say like i see source code more Personally, like a qualitative assessment of it's like a source credit is saying how good someone is at their competency or not because you, the community sort of, um, well, there's certain actions that are sort of metricized, like KPIs, basically you either hit the targets or you don't, or the community has some mechanism to give you input as to how the, the of the quality of, of uh, your outputs. So. I mean, in the I just did the um, T Academy uh, course, and on my presentation, that was a bit around what I was thinking was like using spiral dynamics um, as an emoji system. So it's just the colors, right? The colors of the rainbow, and the praise or other works could be um, basically you could you know pick your color against Nate's output, um, and you know based on the spiral dynamics category, right? So it's sort of and each of them are valuable. It just it's sort of showing. Um, but you want to mix, right? You want to, you do want to, like you said, you want that that right mix of people, and also personalities and strengths and weaknesses, I guess. So, but I was thinking, like, still, you'd want an intake form, maybe at the beginning, just to objectively assess someone's actual skill, so that you don't have to manually decipher it from them, or they have to explain it, or you have to, you'd have like a like how people apply for a job, um, but they're just sort of not applying; they're just sort of. Uh, giving an assessment and it could have some personality, some Belkin components or whatever. And that data is sort of what's um, sort of filtering or guiding you to where you might want to then explore 
in the in the space where you think you'd be the best fit but you could also say well i'm, I'm not so strong in this but i want to really like dive in deep and learn contribute where i can so and then the qualitative source credit part would say good job not good job you know okay let's just be positive let's say good job or could could continue working on that you know like or you just don't get you don't get cred basically uh, it doesn't have too many punitive aspects to it but i i, I kind of imagine it a little like that like it would have a initial assessment like an onboarding with like an actual criteria and then that's only guiding you you can still be very free to walk around and then as you contribute source cred is you know you're hitting those those targets and it's it's noting your contribution if you believe it's configured properly yeah and uh, yeah i agree i, I... I, I, and I want source credit to become that. I just, it's, it's, it's so far away from being that. Um, but it, it's, it's the solution that I think will eventually happen. I, I don't want to be that person that's just said, oh, it's going to end up that way. But, you know, I hope, I hope so. Um, but, but there's one other component that I wanted to mention about the advice process. And maybe this is something that Gravity could talk about in terms of, um, holding our own biases and our own frame frameworks of the world. Um, and I guess, you know, it, since we're speaking of war today, <laughs> I remember the story of um, uh, with the Afghan war, where uh, this uh, military unit was uh, uh, building uh, wells for Afghan villages, and they wanted to build them really close um, and to make it convenient and they were really surprised when uh, the women who were tr in charge of, of going to those wells, getting those wells, were sabotaging these wells and uh, that were dug closer to the village because they, they valued their independence and their time away from, uh, from, from, from the village. And it kind of contradicted this kind of Western projected notions of convenience, efficiency, and modernization. And so... Considering failure to consider multiple stakeholder positions and moving beyond our own organizational and personal frames of reference is really, really important during the advice process um, and something that we don't really talk much about. And so it's one of those things that we carry with us where we say, okay, this is my view of the world. This is my view of how things should happen. And we don't question it. We don't say, well, what other people who, who are being affected by this? I think these concepts that we have within the advice process are very um, either minimally understood or there's a huge misconception about what it really means. And I think that's something that we really need to dig into. And so that's, that's the last thing I'll add to, to that discussion. Yeah, the only thing is I was trying this week on uh, promoting this practice, but I mean, I was just saying, you know, vague words of what uh, you just said in the last two are called, but maybe like, yeah, sharing this graph or like having us some little speech would be, would be helpful. I think um, we haven't posted this um, in our Twitter, but I, 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 I was thinking that uh, this sti was still like in production, this infograph. But if the infograph if is final, we can uh, add it to to the agenda of the Twitter uh, planning. Yeah, I mean, I I think just incorporating it into everything we do, like, I, and, and it takes time. But like, I feel like if we put in the work <clears throat> for like maybe the next five to six months, and we truly embed it within both the culture and the individual. Um, knowledge of, of new members, I think it will just carry on perpetually over time. I, I just think, I think we just have to, to be strict with ourselves and, and, and start educating on this because I guarantee you the use of the advice process will lead to better coordination, better communication, and, and better outcomes for, for the TDC. Um, I think um, I'm not I'm not, I'm not really sure I'm just like uh, drafting this idea but I, but I think like um, what's more important or the part that's more important of the advice process is that the people more involved 
in the TEC, uh, lead it by the example. And I'm like, I don't usually like the idea of, um, of like, I'm, how can I say, like going too hard on implementations like these. Because um, I think it's also important that it finds its own way. Maybe uh, eventually the community sort of, because uh, in theory it's, it's some way, but um, to be uh, comfortable enough to be like, you know, uh, it, to, like naturally it may, it may have to run on its own for a bit without some, like without um, imposing uh, a rigid way to make the advice process, if that makes sense. Yeah, and uh, like yeah, it does make sense. I just, you know, I I agree with you. I don't want to. I don't think this should be like a rigid process that we follow. I just think it's a tool that you can use. But in order to use it properly, uh, people need to be educated on it, and that's the only thing. Because I, I really don't want to be like, hey, you have to do this. You have to go through this. Um, but if there are consequences uh, to a poor decision that's being made because we made failed to use the advice process, like I myself am guilty of. Uh, when we screwed up in the comps comps team, um, it was very unfortunate, and it was I, I I did not perceive the potential consequences of my decision, and so I just executed on it, and I did not go through the advice process, and there was serious consequences to it, and that sucks. That's a that's a crappy feeling, yeah. and so um, just trying to avoid that and making sure that everybody can avoid that as well because it's when I was making the decision, I didn't even comprehend that it could have a potential consequence and it did. So. But yes, yeah, stay away from rigid. In all fairness, Nate, that, that escaped several of us and none of us at that time could comprehend the consequences of what we were sort of like setting in motion but yeah i think it opened our eyes to to the fact that there's work to be done yeah and 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 i mean i i don't know if it's proper maybe i should ask juan to if i give people context on the situation of what happened i don't know if anybody opposes that if so please say something right now uh, especially Mount Manu. Uh, no. Well, I think um, it 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 was uh, handled when it happened, and um, it doesn't have any sensitive information or anything. And I also think that sharing this can also be like a learning opportunity for others. So uh, as you feel comfortable. Yeah, and Mount Manu, you okay with that as well? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. So just to give you an example, we were doing our first newsletter ever, new tools, new equipment, new everything, uh, based on uh, some laws that, that are required for newsletters and using CRMs. Uh, we had to include a physical address, and we didn't have a physical address considering we are DAO. And so we said, okay, well, let's look at what Common Stack did. And we just said, screw it. And I grab the address from common stack and we just put it onto our newsletter and that had consequences. And I did not understand the consequences of that action because of the linkage between uh, common stack and TEC should have been separate um, from a legal perspective. And it led to the resigning of the president of common stack. And so um, this is something that was a very simple decision that we made. And um, you know, it, it had, unintended consequences that we could have never foreseen but we could have prevented it if we went through the advice process in the proper way if we evaluated our decision from start to finish and said does this impact anybody does using this address impact anybody do we know the answer to this who should we ask should we submit it on the proposal on the forum should we go through the the, ste the necessary steps and we just didn't do it and so that stuck with me because it's something that, you know, something I took for granted was a decision I was being, I was making. 
And that's, I didn't think had any consequence. I thought it was a small impact matter and it wasn't, and it could have been all avoided if we just used the advice process. And that's something that I just want to kind of put to the forefront because we want to prevent these types of things from happening in the future. And so that's why I stress the importance of using the advice process and stress the importance of understanding our decision space and making sure that we're collaborating and making sure that we're keeping each other accountable. Yeah, I also think that the advice process is very related to the culture of transparency and of um, accessibility of information because um, here a lot of our decisions impact others and and um, I think that um, this can help us to have like a more transparent um, community and also to foster coordination because I have uh, noticed that uh, sometimes people there are two people that have like the same idea or want to work on the same project and they are trying to make um, and they are making different e efforts separated efforts uh, from one another and uh, another cool thing about having a, a culture of advice process is that if you know or see that someone is working in, in something that you are working on then you can participate so so it's just like don't do things without um, sharing with others because you might find support and at the same time you can you can um, yeah avoid making mistakes or 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 even finding some information that that you were not taking into account so yeah I think it's also something that we should promote like a cultural practice and uh, um, and relate that a lot with all of our process of transparency and even um, our our um, uh, our structure that tries to be non non hierarchical. Yeah, I was just gonna jump in. I like this. I I like this ad advice process a lot, and I um, I think it's really a, a great mitigation for these types of issues, and also like harnessing collective intelligence. I was just thinking about how you can seamlessly enforce it. I was playing with this uh, tool called Komunda, which is a it's a float. It basically does uh, it digitizes standard operating procedures. So if you are gonna did if you're gonna agree on this standard operating procedure, you know, thinking around how you we could digitize it and record it so that you you have confirmation, you have like a documentation that the process was consistently followed in each of the working groups or all those decision points. And um, I don't know how well Komunda integrates into Discord, but uh, but anyway, it's just worth thinking about because I think it's this is great, but it's like how really to not just implement this digitally, but then also really making sure that we're capturing the data so that we have a good documentation of those steps were followed, that everything was complete with that process and that the people are sort of accountable. They've put, they've signed off on it sort of. And do you have a link to that? To Komunda? I, uh, yeah. You can actually, I was watching some, so uh, I can find it. It's on, I was watching some YouTube uh, videos, which I thought they were, and they made it fun, right? It was like, Let's have Captain Kirk needs to escape from some island, and it made a workflow. <laughs> they digitized the workflow. Um, so I've been I've been dabbling with it, but let me I'll find let me see if I can find a link and put it in the chat. Okay, and go ahead, Jim. Sorry. For, for the purposes here, it might be sufficient to uh, assign emoji uh, to steps in the process, so that uh, you can see immediately uh, on a um, uh, 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 a task or proposal, whatever, uh, that the different steps have been taken by someone, by anyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, th I think implementing the advice process on a cultural level uh, would be the ideal way to, the ideal way to do that. Um, we talked about this last week. 
I don't remember if it was Safko, but um, and we were talking about, um, you know, uh, Durgada was specifically talking about liberating structures and how, and, and that we have to be careful in some, and that sometimes is good to not be um, as politically correct, for example, when talking or when uh, doing stuff. Um, I like the advice process, but I'm worried and I don't like the idea of, of you know, of being too hard on it because it can also create a lot of friction for people. If every time I have to do something, I have to follow a read method and record it and I have to, you know, to have a, um, something that proves that I did, that, that I did the advice process in a certain way. Well, yeah, I, I I think that you've you're we're like we're we're hitting we're hitting both sides of of the the, the equation here because it, it's it's so frustrating because on one hand I I want to have like I think it's really important to avoid rigid structures to have type of uh, these kind of, kind of liberating structures where we embed these processes within itself. And on the other hand, we have, you know, being a part of a DAO is, is a very risky, risky endeavor. Like all of us are taking a risk because we're not legally recognized. And so each of us holds uh, liability uh, for the actions of each other. And so that, that's a very dangerous thing. And so like having the tools like uh, decentralized SDGs or what Jim mentioned, using the emojis to making sure that there's a, a track record and documentation of process and, and making sure that we're following through with these brings accountability and it brings individual responsibility towards the actions of the organization. And so uh, balancing these two out between having these kind of emergent behaviors, which we want to encourage, which is the, like, that's, that's the future. That's what we want to have happen um but, but we are not legally protected and so having this type of bureaucratic almost rigid like structure protects us in a lot of ways and so balancing these two these two notions out in the moment right now is very important and uh, i think that uh, i i would prefer that the advice process be embedded as nt in, was talking about into within within culture but also having the tools that SDG and Jim are talking about to make sure that we, we, we keep accountable to ourselves and that we have trust in each other and we keep building that trust over time. Um, I think that that is kind of the core argument there. I think the advice process is something else. Um, but the, the idea, you know, back from extreme programming in the nineties and, uh, agile, you know, was the notion of the buddy system, which proved to be very effective. And uh, uh, I've been trying to experiment with having, uh, always having two people assigned to a project. I mean, if one, if, if one or a task, if one, if it's one person, it's a personal thing. If it's two people, then it becomes a group thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it can be just somebody watching over your shoulder or it can be, you know, doing a better problem solution than, than either one of you could do independently. And part of that is review of, you know, is this the right thing to do? <laughs> okay. You have two heads that are better than one, <laughs> but they know when to get advice. <laughs> uh, more yeah. likely. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Um, the, the only concern I have with that is that um, we when trying to foster emergent behavior and scaling uh, the type of work that decentralized organizations need to foster, um, I think the buddy system breaks down a little bit. I think that you know we we need to have individuals who are willing to say, "Hey, I want to execute on this thing," and they can collaborate and pull people in, uh, but it's not required. Um, and so it, avoiding rigid structures is really, really important that we're not saying you have to do things this way. You have to do things this way. Um, I'm just uh, saying that, you know, what we've been trained to do in plan A is, uh, you know, individual accomplishment. And what, you know, our research has shown is that, that, that 
we can act with a collective intelligence and it starts, you know, peer, peer, peer to peer. But, you know, like starting a group, you know, having a guide and a scribe or having two guides or having two people uh, 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 is a seed. And really, you don't want to go over four or five in a group, uh, generally. Um, but, uh, you know, to maximize the uh, uh, emergent collective behavior, uh, that's greater than what anybody could do by themselves. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure how to do it, but, you know, you know, I'm thinking we start out by, uh, you know, you, somebody's doing something, we'll get a buddy and somebody to to uh, uh, be a partner or to uh, do a code review or whatever. <laughs> to, uh, but it's something to consider. Yeah, I, I think, Jim you might be saying like, maybe not like everything you're working on has to be with like someone, you know, all the time. But like, if you're doing something async or by yourself, like we need to have, you know, a second set of eyes or just something along those lines. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to be like you're, uh, synced with someone on everything you're doing it's just like we want that some element of the the group collective consciousness at play there right we, you know we peer to peer we start peer to peer and you know, we uh, get the best collective intelligence uh, yeah. but uh I was just going to jump in thinking around like the one the one component that we don't have that works well with peer to peer is when you're on a project, you have a very clear project document, you know, mapped out with milestones and what you're and, you know, with fixed deliverables. But if if it's kept very fluid and I think that's sort of a bit how DAOs operate, they're just sort of organic. I do see this advice process as maybe um, a, a better fit because it it does try to, like you said, try to harness that collective intelligence. And that's what the process, if the process is good, it does that, right? It's actually like it's a good stakeholder consultation, getting the views and then building collective intelligence. But, you know, the, you can do collective intelligence the bad way where you get everyone's bad ideas, right? <laughs> so, or you can get everyone's good ideas and that's what you want to optimize for. So it's, of course, that is always can be monitored to make sure you actually are optimizing everyone's best ideas and best efforts. And then, you know, that's driving it. But, but the process does seem to be the best safeguard as a minimal bureaucracy to having what I think is a more bureaucratic administrative burden, which would be, you know, these very detailed project, doc, you know, all this paperwork that goes around, you know, how you would currently set up like a, a project with an initiative and, um, you know, very strict, uh, you know, fixed the budgets and deadlines. And um, I mean, you need that sometimes and there, you see that there's proposals in the DAO, but I think in the implementation part, it should always be, or I not always, but I think we should, we should think about how we are embedding collective intelligence as a process. In, in, in there. Over. Yeah. Uh, we're getting value from the people. What can they do what they want to do? We don't necessarily, we have a, so much to do, it almost doesn't matter what order we do it. So when something has energy, when some project has energy and it's something that we need um, uh, and we can fund it, whatever, um, we go ahead on. Uh, uh, I'll try to br briefly summarize what we did with the bounty system and eyes uh, on uh, our chain, where we had three uh, the three pirate rule. If three people uh, uh, basically sponsored a project, uh, they would get funding. 
And uh, we found we needed a guide system in each subject area. And, of course, the guy had a higher trust rating, so we could basically vote them out. <laughs> uh, or, you know, multiple guides could vote them out. And we're rebuilding that trust network on chain now. It was in PHP before. Uh, but that... that uh, uh, type of thing, uh, having a trust network, um, I think is important for an organization, even a leaderless organization, in that um, you have a core group with the highest trust, and they certify others with trust. And when several others certify another as trust up to their rating, they get they get. Uh, added to the trust. Um. Yeah, and Jim, I just wanted to say that you know this this advice process is very basic, you know, and, and so if you have any suggestions or ideas in, in terms of making it uh, more effective, I like I would love love for you to engage with that either on the forum or with the, this the SoftGov group or within. Uh, I was, I'm hoping to hold an advice process meeting at some point to review the advice process with Livy. Um, I would love to have you there, um, and I, and I just wanted to also say that the the fundamental assumption with the advice process is that, you know, those who are closest to the problem are the ones that are best equipped to make uh, to, to to make that decision. Right. And so um, that that is the, the the core fundamental thesis of of this advice process. But it is bare bones. It is it is just the beginning. It is the most digestible form that we can give it. Um, however, it is a lot more complex and, and something that we do need to educate on, but also iterate on over and over again. So, if you have ideas and stuff like that, I would love for you to to engage with. Yeah, that. I, I would I would just say you know it, it might be uh, uh, worthwhile to assign a guide role to the people that are that are on the advice team, whatever. Uh, that have uh, trust in their area, whatever. Um. Yeah, right. Right now, we have SM, our subject matter experts, which is a very poorly defined within the TEC, which is unfortunate because we haven't really figured out uh, a system where it's like, you know, you know, if if there's a problem with Discord, uh, we we may not call people subject matter expert in Discord, but like. You know, we all go to Vive IV to fix those problems. <laughs> so I consider Vive IV to be an expert in Discord, even though he may not consider himself an expert in Discord. Uh, but he's our best option at the moment, you know, because he's he's the one who does everything for us. And so um, having that dynamic of expectations for for his role and what we expect of him in terms of giving advice and the steward's role, which is also incorporated in this, who who kind of sees the big picture. And, and makes a decision based off of the advice given by subject matter experts and the, the contributors who are actually on the ground making the decision and implementing that, that decision. So yeah. um, the roles and the advice process are connected and intertwined, and that's just another thing that we have to educate on as well. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm new to the community. You know, I, we have a number of token engineering problems in our chain, and um, I find, you know, that there's a lot to your structure here that is well, very well thought out and reasonably mature um, and a good model for us to follow. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, so uh, 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 I'll, after looking around, I'll figure out how we, how, how we could best collaborate. I mean, that's, if anything else, if nothing else, we want to be able to have interoperable humans between TEC and our chain. Yeah, no doubt. And um, uh, since we're getting close to the top of the hour, I'm going to pass it back to Zepti. Did you have anything else on the agenda? I'm sorry for taking so much time on the advice process here. No, I mean, actually, that was the the only topic I could think about. Of. Uh, and yeah, it's cool, like we uh, discussed it so much. And yeah, like I think like we are almost on the top of the hour. Like uh, if you guys want to keep ch charging out the advice process, like feel free to keep here in the room. 
and then there is also a gravity call in four minutes so i think like we can wrap up this call and and yeah and uh, yeah use this time for uh, yeah rest a little bit and get ready for gravity thank you everyone thank you